Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. And amen. Well, good morning. How are you? Hey, I've got an announcement to make. Um, our security team, which by the way, if you've not noticed, we have a security team both in the building and outside the building. Uh, those guys and those ladies uh, just kind of keep eyes on the place as we're in here, but they just handed me a note that there is a white GMC Yukon uh, sitting by the sign. Your lights are on. We do have a battery charger, um, but uh, if you want to go turn those off, uh, they're on. So uh, anyway, white Yukon sitting by the sign. Uh, I would read off the um, license plate number, but I can't read it. Um, so it's a white GMC Yukon, all right? So uh, if, if you don't go, we have a battery charger. We can jump you off or some cables or something like that. So anyway, hey, uh, on that uh, uh, fall festival, Jake um, kind of talked about my exaggerations, but there is a ton of people that come uh, to that thing. But I'm really excited because on that Sunday of the 28th, uh, there's a guy named Curtis Grimes, who's the Texas country uh, uh, singer who's just knocking it out of the park on the charts. He's going to be here that morning along with his whole band from Austin. And uh, Curtis got saved about two years ago, radically saved, and uh, has stayed in the country music scene. And uh, we've invited him not only to be at the fall festival, but uh, to be here on Sunday morning. So if you love country music, if you love Texas country music, uh, Clay, I told you, it's coming. So uh, uh, you don't want to miss that Sunday. Bring somebody with you because that's going to be an incredible, incredible day to get to hear his story, get to hear some really great music. And then that night he's going to be doing a couple sets uh, over in the Generations Auditorium for our fall festival. So really excited about that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we started a new series and I asked the question in that series, have you ever felt like a failure? Have you ever had those times where it just like, man, I blew it. I blew it. How do I ever get over this? How do I ever get past this? And, and so we started kind of digging around into the soul two weeks ago. And, and we, we made this statement. I want to throw it up on the screen because it, I told you I'd say this every week. And here's what we said. Failure is never final as long as love exists. Failure is never final as long as love exists. We know that Jesus Christ was sent into the world for us to save us because we were sinners and sin separated us from God. And because of Jesus coming, and dying on the cross, but not just dying, Jesus rose from the grave three days later, conquering death, hell, and sin, so that you and I, through surrendering our life to him, could have eternal life, and he would take all of our failure and all of our sin, and he would redeem that into an incredible story. Because here's what we know, every one of us were created to live on purpose. We've been talking about this the last two weeks, that God has gifted us, and, and if we're in Christ, we're a new creation. And when we're in Christ, he takes all those gifts and those talents, and then he uses those gifts. And he even gives us spiritual gifts so that we can live up to our purpose. And when we don't live up to our purpose or potential, we create what's called a frustration gap. If you've missed this over the last couple of weeks, you can go back. We drew it out on the board the last two weeks. But in that frustration gap between our reality and where God has called us, what we will tend to do if we can't close that gap, if we can't get over our failures or get over something that's happened in our past. And what we'll do is we'll begin to function out of that frustration gap, uh, that, that what I call the failure gap. And we'll start looking for escapes or we'll start looking for shelters or we'll start running into a cave as we learned last week with Elijah. Or maybe you're under that juniper tree, a very 
poor uh, way to shelter from what's going on in your past. And so we've just kind of been digging around in that. And if you remember last week, we talked about how God wants to take your failures and your identity. By the way, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. That means the old is gone, the new has come. If you're in Jesus, all right, you're not who you used to be. You're not who you always have been because you are now in Christ. And so the old man is dead and God has given you a new man. And so in that new man, what God wants to do is take all those failures in your identity, and he wants to round your story out to grace because that's the power of story. When we begin to worship him, even through our failures, even through our sins, even through those things that happened to us years and years ago that we are stuck and we're in a cave, God wants to round that story out to grace. But you know, I was looking at scripture and few have fallen as hard as publicly as Peter. In the New Testament, there was Jesus had disciples and what I love about Peter's story, it's real. It's personal, it's my story, it's your story. Because Peter is us. And that's what makes his story so personal. Because when you read through the story of Peter, you begin to realize in the gospels, Peter was one of those guys that he was, he was a risk taker. He was a little bit mouthy. Anybody mouthy, don't look at your spouse. Don't, 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 don't look at your spouse. Don't look at your kids either, okay? <laughs> he was mouthy, he was a risk taker. He fumbled a lot, he denied, but Peter's our story, isn't it? When you look at Peter's story, we see a story of grace and love and renewal and Jesus called Peter, if you remember that story that Andrew and Peter and Jesus was walking on that beach and they found the Messiah and, and it's at that moment where Jesus called Peter out and gave Peter a new identity and, and he went from Simon to Peter which meant you're the rock that I'm gonna use you and build you and you're gonna be used in the kingdom in a way you can never dream or imagine. And Peter took a risk, you know, he was that guy that they were out on the boat because they were a bunch of fishermen and it was, uh, you know, kind of agricultural time and they were always on the water and they were going across the water and, and Jesus sent them on ahead. And if you remember that story where Jesus started walking on water and he went out to them and Peter being the mouthy one and the risk taker, Lord, if that's you, tell me to get out, come to, the, come to you. And what did Peter do? He jumped out of the boat and walked on water, which by the way, if you're going to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat, just saying. Let me know how that works this week. You know, it's also Peter that declared Jesus as the Messiah. When Jesus was asking him, who do you say I am? And it was Peter who said, you are the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting on. And yet almost in that same breath, he also tells Jesus, you're not gonna die. <laughs> I mean, the guy was mouthy. I so relate to him, amen? Anybody else? Am I the only one? Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, yeah, I think we do. It's because it's so personal. Then on the night that Jesus was betrayed, Peter's mouth again gets him in trouble. And we know the story. And he opened it. And oh, did he open it? Denying the Christ, not once, not twice, but three times. And yet at that moment, we're going to look at that in just a minute. We're gonna be in John chapter 18, working our way to John chapter 21. So if you have your Bibles or your apps, you can get there. But after Peter's denial, something changed. Something died in him. You see, the reason I think Peter's story is so real is because we've all been there, haven't we? We've all had that moment where we sinned or someone sinned against us and we got stuck and something died. His own bold confidence and strength were killed. And he was no longer the unmovable rock. He was feeling that sand under his feet. And we've been there, haven't we? In fact, in John chapter 18, verse 15, let's look at it. It'll be on the screen. You can follow us along. It says, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus because this disciple was known to be the high priest. He went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there and brought Peter in. Verse 17, you aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. And look what he said, I am not. <laughs> it was cold and the servants and officials stood around a fire. I don't miss that. We're going to come back to that. That they had made to keep him warm. And Peter also was standing with them, warming them. Story cuts over to the high priest questioning Jesus. And then in verse 25, look at it. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, 
you aren't one of those disciples too, are you? He denied it saying, I am not. One of the high priest servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off. Remember, he cut the guy's ear off, loud mouth, right? Challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? And again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. The story goes on in chapter 21. We're working towards 21 that Jesus goes before Pilate. He is sentenced to be crucified. And he is crucified there on the cross. And he is taken from the cross when he died and placed into a tomb. And we know the story in chapter 20 that they find the empty tomb and Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene and, and to the disciples and to doubting Thomas. And man, there, there's a great guy that's not gonna believe anything until he touches and sees and, and, and actually looks at it. And then in chapter 21, we see the response of great failure. See, all through what we've said over the last two weeks, the whole scriptures, all the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is a response to colossal failure. That men and women all through the scripture failed. And, 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 and we look at God's word, we see God's response to failure. And in just a moment, we're gonna see God's response because at that moment, it doesn't seem like Jesus is gonna restore Peter. Because if you go back and you read that, he's not talking to Peter and he appears to the disciples. He talks to Mary Magdalene, he talks to Thomas, but there's no mention of Peter. He was there. You ever been in the presence when you, when you know the shame and you know the guilt is there and yet it seems like nobody notices? That's kind of where Peter is. So Peter says, I'm just gonna go fishing. I think that's why I like him too, he fishes, amen? <laughs> Peter just returns to what's comfortable to him, to what he knows and trusts. And yet his failure still looms over him. And, and yet the denial of Jesus plagues him so he just can't shake the thought of what he did. And see, I think that's where some of you are today is you can't shake the thought of what you've done. Maybe it was years ago when you were 19 years old or maybe it was that day in college where you blew it, man, and, and you're stuck there and you can't shake what you did. And maybe you're watching on Facebook or e-text or online and, and you're stuck by something that happened years and years ago. And so what do we do when we get stuck? We go to what's comfortable. Just like Elijah went to that juniper tree and eventually that cave, Peter just goes back to what's comfortable. He goes fishing. Because that's what he grew up doing. Can you blame him? Can you blame him? See, we all do this. We all turn to what we know. What's comfortable? Look at verse 2 of chapter 21. Simon, Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. And Peter says, I'm going out to fish. <laughs> they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And Jesus called out to them, friends, you catching any? No. I say that a lot. <laughs> then he answered, they answered and he said in verse six, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped in the water like Forrest Gump. Y'all remember that scene in Forrest Gump where he sees Lieutenant Dan, Lieutenant Dan, and he just jumps out of the boat. There's Peter, right? That's why I love this guy. And the other disciples followed in the boat. Some of you are stuck on that right now. You're not gonna be able to catch up with us. So come on and catch up with me. Sorry about that. Uh, the other disciples followed in the boat in verse eight, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire. There it is, a fire burning of coals with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter jumped back in the water. He climbed back into the boat and he dragged the net ashore. It's full of large fish, about 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. See, Peter just did what he always did. He just went fishing. 
But early in the morning, they hadn't caught a single fish. And the first night back on the water, they're catching nothing. Can you imagine Peter? I mean, he grew up a fisherman. And he walked away from his nets three years earlier to follow the Messiah. And he goes back to what he knows after he's already failed, I already denied Jesus. And he goes and spends the first night on the water and he doesn't catch anything. He can't even catch a fish. He's a failed disciple. He's a failed fisherman. You can't imagine what he felt at that point. But yet we can, can't we? I mean, nothing good is coming Peter's way. You ever said that? Seems like nothing good ever happens to me. How could he go on living? How could he carry on? And then a man on the beach. See, it's not unusual to see people when you're fishing. It happens to me all the time. In fact, I was fishing this last week and came around a dock and there was a guy standing there. And you know what his question was? You catching any? You know what my answer was? No. <laughs> then I hooked into a big old catfish. But anyway, um, but instantly, when Peter heard those words, he knew it was the Lord. He knew it was the Lord. And then when he heard those words, throw your net on the other side, he recognized that command. Because three years earlier, that's what Jesus told him to do. And three years earlier, he heard that voice. And when he heard that voice, he jumped in the water. And when he got to the shore, Jesus, in all of his grace and all of his beauty and all of it, who he is, had a fire there with fish on it and bread that Jesus had prepared breakfast for those. And in his account, John makes the point that he was cooking fish over a charcoal fire. Can you imagine when Peter approached that and smelt that fire and smelt that, the reminder that just, just a few days before when he stood around that fire and said, I don't know him and all the guilt and all the shame. Whew. See, some of you are there. Because every time you come to church, and this is the first time you've been in church in years, it's like smelling that charcoal fire. But look, don't stop. Look at verse 15 of John 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Well, yes, Lord, he said. You, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. And then a third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter at this point was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, two of the most powerful words, follow me. It's incredible. Can you imagine being questioned like Jesus, how it would stab his heart? Not once, not twice, that when Jesus looked him in the eye, when Jesus made eye contact with Peter, you know Peter was crushed. You know at that moment, the smell of the charcoal fire, and now the words is forcing Peter to confront those deepest, darkest moments of his life. But Jesus wasn't being cruel. You see, I think Jesus was being thorough, kind, and gracious. Listen to me, Jesus know, knew, and I think we need to hear this today, Jesus knew that restoration could only happen with complete honesty. Let me say that again. Restoration can only happen with complete honesty. And Jesus had to get down into the heart of Peter and poke around a little bit in there. And this painful, tender moment became the turning point in Peter's life. As Peter wept, bitter tears and grief, but he needed Jesus to graciously reach out to him not to confront him, not to rebuke him. See, listen, listen to me, look at me, look at me, look at me right here. Don't miss this if you're listening online. Some of you think if you come to Jesus, he's gonna rebuke you when you, what you need to hear this morning is he wants to restore you. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna poke around in your heart a little bit. He's gonna ask for complete honesty. But he wants to restore you. 
You see, Peter needed Jesus to rehabilitate him, to forgive him, to make him new again. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you truly love me, Simon, son of John? Do you truly love me? And three times Peter says, well, yeah, you know. And that third time, there had to be some doubt. <laughs> that third time, Peter's like, ah, you know all things. And now I'm not sure. So, yeah, I love you. You ever been there? <laughs> I don't feel it right now, Lord. In fact, I'm kind of hurting. But, but, but I love you. And Jesus tenderly reached out to that wounded, hurt, and afraid little boy named Peter. Peter. And I believe what he wants to do for you and for us to reach out graciously to our wounded, hurt little boy or little girl inside and restore you. Jesus is facing the man he offended, the one he denied and rejected. And now Peter can't even talk. Peter was unable to go to Jesus. So Jesus had to come to him. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus went to Peter, pursued him. And we're no different. See, when we kind of just mess it up, and those mistakes or those sin, or when someone sins against us, we almost find it impossible to go to someone who's offended us. We're more likely to hide in a cave or more likely to run 40 days into the wilderness and get under a tree. And when that doesn't work, we'll run even further into the wilderness. However, Jesus taught his disciples something. See, I told you a few weeks ago, if what you say doesn't line up with what you do, then people are going to have a hard time following you because what you say, if what you're doing contradicts what you're saying, then what you're saying doesn't matter. And when Jesus was walking with his disciples, he said this in Matthew, look at this passage. Jesus said, he said, if your brother or sister sins against you, go to them. If they listen to you, you've won them over. Listen, Jesus is now, he said it, now he's doing it. Isn't that good? He's going to Peter. Peter sinned against him, denied him. And Jesus told him he was going to do it. <laughs> and he did it anyway. Again, we're not that much different. And Jesus came to Peter to forgive him, to win him over. Now hear that, church. Jesus is coming to win you over, to win your heart. And when your life just totally falls apart and the hurt party is out there, then what Jesus is demonstrating is not only did he preach it, now he's demonstrating you go to them. You don't wait for them to come to you. You go to them. It's hard, isn't it? <laughs> and the reason you go to them is to win them over, not to rebuke them. See, somewhere along the way, we thought we're to rebuke people, right? And yet we see the Savior himself not rebuking Peter. He's going to restore him in the humility, the courage to go and forgive. It's Christ-like to go to those people who spoke or did the unimaginable to you and restore them and forgive them. <laughs> to go in love and offer a way out for them a way back to Christ, a way back to renewal. Oh, it's hard. Oh, it's hard to swallow your pride. I had to last Tuesday. I had a phone call on Monday that I was just not dialed in. You ever been there? It popped up on my calendar. I wasn't ready for it. I got on the phone and basically bluffed my way through the phone call, hung the phone up, and as soon as I hung the phone up, I went, I did not honor him. But I had to go to a volleyball game, so I ran. Went to the volleyball game, sat over in Big Sandy all night, 
watching my babies play the whole time, replaying that conversation in my head. Get up on Tuesday morning, I had to go to a staff meeting, staff development, we had a great staff meeting. But as soon as I got out of staff meeting, I'm setting up in my office and I'm just going, I owe him an amends. So I wrote out two emails and deleted them. And finally just picked the phone up and called him. It's hard. But when it's done, it's powerful. It's not only powerful for you, but them, and individually and communally. When we begin to see people that have the courage to not just say it, but do it. By the way, James talks about a man who has faith without deeds. Hello. And here Jesus is demonstrating, don't just say it, go do it. And what happens is it renews and builds a relationship. And it restores a hurting person. And then healing takes place. And listen, if you've ever been through this, you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever done this, you know the power and how incredible this is. And Jesus went to Peter to heal him, to restore him, to renew him, to forgive him. And if Peter was to grow and become the rock that Jesus said he was going to be, then Jesus was coming to him and saying, I'm not done with you. Feed my lambs. Can you imagine the first time Jesus said that? Peter's like, really? Can I? I mean, do you remember what I did? And Jesus said, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Did, did you say what I think you said? Peter, do you love me? Take care of my sheep, son. Can you, can you just, you ever been there when you've been restored? Listen, three and a half years ago, this is not in my notes, but I feel like I need to just share this with you. I walked through that process. When our elders came to me and they walked me through a process of saying, you're our pastor. So we want you to feed the sheep. And the power of restoration, when you know you've blown it, not only changes you and the one being restored, it changes a community. And God takes your story and he rounds that story of failure and identity out to grace. You see, Peter is hearing from Jesus that Jesus says, I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you. And I've always wondered why Jesus asked three times, and I'm not sure we know, you know, maybe the three questions related to the three denials, but maybe even in those days that when they entered into contracts, they would, they, they would have a threefold questions and answers in that contract. And I don't know, maybe it was both, but what we do know is that Jesus blotted out Peter's denials and he restored him, rounding out that story to bring worship and magnifying Jesus by Jesus going to him. See, this is good news because Peter need, needed restoration. He needed his sin blotted out. We need to hear the story of grace in Peter to watch him come forth as a new man. We need to hear that same story that, so that we can be made new. Because some of you are fighting some things years ago, but the grace of Jesus Christ is as much for us as it was for Peter. And he's calling you. He's calling me. Peter needed Jesus. You need Jesus. And he knew it all too well after stumbling and falling that he needed Jesus. And he was restored. A powerful breakfast. Peter continued to grow in faith and we see him begin to reawaken that boldness and those things begin to happen. In fact, go back to verse 19. I want you to look at it again. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death which Peter would glorify God. See, he told Peter, said, Peter, not only am I going to restore you, son, you're going to end up dying the same way I did. Now, if for some of us, we hear that and go, oh. And Peter was like, uh. But think, think about what Jesus was speaking to him. You are 
forgiven. You're forgiven. Yeah, I know you nearly cut the guy's head off. I know you denied me three times. But son, I'm fixing to put you on a course. And then those last two words, look at it. Then he said, and this is so big. No guilt, no shame, just forgiveness. Follow me. You see, Peter couldn't follow him early on. He couldn't stand up to the masses in the garden. He couldn't stop the beating that Jesus received and he, he couldn't prevent him from dying on the cross. He couldn't even follow Jesus at that time, but now Jesus is looking at him and saying, follow me. All that's behind you, follow me. And Peter takes up his cross and follows him and becomes the rock that Jesus built the early church on, leaving his fishing boats and tackle and gear behind. We never see it again. He goes to Jerusalem, he begins to preach, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 people were saved in one day. Hello. The guy that trembled at the question of that little girl is now able to face a mob unafraid. He endured the persecution and became a rock. So what does Peter's story teach us this morning? Well, number one, I think you need to hear this again. Jesus went out to find Peter. And I believe Jesus is looking for you this morning. Even though you feel like you're a victim and you wear that as a badge and it always goes back to that and you always repeat the same story, Jesus is coming right into the middle of that. And he's wanting to restore that. And you may feel wronged in this room. You may feel like the one that, that event that happened in your early 20s where you did the unthinkable, the unimaginable. And you think God could never forgive you and never save you and never redeem you. You need to hear this morning that Jesus went looking for Peter and didn't just go looking for him to rebuke him. He went looking for him to restore him, built a fire, caught some fish, cooked the fish, cooked the bread, and invited him to sit down and then said, son, follow me. God's grace flowed abundantly in Peter. And listen to me, Peter is me, Peter is you, Peter is us. But the actual denial of Peter as such can never be replaced. But listen to me, yet we all deny the Lord, don't we? You may not say it out loud. You might say it in your finances. You might say it in your marriage. You might say it in your mission, your job. Oh, Peter, we all have those moments. And God's grace flows abundantly to me, to you, to us, to all of us who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who follow his voice. Listen to me. Christ came into the world and he emptied himself. He emptied himself of all of his Godhead to come and be our savior. And he walked among us for 33 years, perfect, sinless, facing the same temptations we face, facing the same darkness we face, and he did not sin. They arrested him, they put him on a cruel cross, he died, and here's what changed everything, is that he rose again. He rose again so that you and I could walk in the grace and the restoration of forgiveness and healing. Because you can't do it on your own. Some of you've tried. Some of you've worked your entire life to be good enough. You've worked your entire life around something that happened to you. 30 years ago, and it defines you. And here's what Jesus is doing. He's stepping into what you think defines you, and he's calling you out, saying, follow me. I'll take all this stuff. And see, it scares some of you to let go of this stuff. 
because it works for you until it doesn't. And that's why you'll leave here. If you don't reconcile this, you'll leave here and go to another church and you'll take all this stuff and it'll follow you there and it'll work until it doesn't. And here's what Jesus is saying to us through Peter. He is stepping right into our dysfunction. He's saying, follow me. And I'm going to take all this stuff that you think can never be forgiven. And because you are in Christ and a new creation, I'm going to redeem. I'm going to blot out. I'm going to forgive. And I'm going to round your story out to something beautiful. See, that's the power of story. That's the power of story. And as long as we stay under the juniper tree and stay in the cave, as long as we just go fishing, and maybe fishing's not your thing, maybe golf, maybe, maybe it's scrapbooking, maybe it's Pinterest, maybe it's, I don't know. What's your thing that you run back to that God's wanting to step right into the middle of and redeem? His grace flows into us as forgiven and healed people, just like Peter. Each of us has fallen. Every one of us in this room needs forgiveness by Jesus. You see, in Peter's day, at the very end of his life, as Peter began to grow the church and he ended up leaving the original Jerusalem council, if you go back and you look at Acts, and he began to travel and go out to the Greeks and, and the Gentiles and some of those outlying areas. When he, when he went to the church, he wrote two books called First and Second Peter. And, and in that book, this is amazing, if you go back and read that, he no longer was just talk. He wouldn't just talk anymore because he had failed miserably. And he was writing to a group of people in First and Second Peter that was suffering. They were actually suffering for doing good. They were actually suffering for following Jesus. And Peter now was encouraging them. And all of a sudden, his words had weight because he'd been forgiven. So let me ask you a question. Have you been forgiven? How long are you gonna stay in that cave? Oh yeah, the wind's blowing all around you. The rocks are being destroyed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy out there. And Jesus is whispering to you, come, follow me, and I'll take all this that you think's destruction, and I'm gonna redeem it, I'm gonna blot it out, I'm going to bring it in, and I'm gonna use you so that your words have weight. I want to put you on display so that the, all the world will see that I am the one true king, Jesus. <laughs> see, that's the power of story. And, and some of you are going to continue to work your failure, continue to work your victim, continue to work your unforgiveness, and it's going to work until it doesn't, and then you'll have to reinvent it. Or the power of story. When Jesus said, hey, come on, come follow me. I'll take all that stuff. I'll take all that stuff, and I'll redeem it. And I'll restore you. Amen? Let me pray for you. Well, Father, I love you, and I thank you this morning that you are a God who just says to us that failure is never final as long as love exists, and his name is Jesus. And Father, I know there's some folks in here this morning, they love you, they're Peter, that's us. Yet, God, there's something that happened two years ago, three years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 40 years ago, that they're just stuck. And so, God, I pray as they smell the coal this morning, the fire, that God, they'd begin to listen to your voice saying, follow me. I love you. You're fully loved and fully forgiven. Follow me. I'll take all this stuff. Yeah, it's, it's scary to leave your stuff, but come on and I'll round that story out. So God, I pray for courage this morning. I pray the, for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I pray for repentance this morning of your followers God, as they smell those coals, they wouldn't see shame or guilt. They would see love 
and forgiveness. God, I pray for that one that sits here this morning that has never surrendered their life to Christ. And they know that if they died today, they don't know where they'd spend an eternity. They're not even sure about eternity, but there's something in their heart right now that goes, if that's really Jesus, I want him. That God, you're calling them to salvation. I pray that right now, you give them the courage to simply pray a prayer that says, I'm a sinner. God, please forgive me. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave. I surrender my life to you and I'll follow you. God, I pray that if there's someone here this morning that prayed that, that God, you give them courage to tell somebody to walk out of this building and live a new life in Christ. You say if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, we'll be saved. So God, I pray that for that one or two or maybe 10 that doesn't know you, that you'd save them. So Lord, I love you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for showing us picture after picture after picture of using a bunch of flaw jacked up people and forgiving us and using our stories to bring you glory and to worship you. I love you. Thank you for Jesus. And we ask it in his name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer or anything like that, we have a place called Grace Place right over here. We would love for you to go by and visit with them. Maybe you got some more questions. Maybe you're just not ready. Because see, I know some of you may not be ready. So here's what I would say to you. You're safe here. We're not afraid of questions. And if you want to keep coming back and investigating the claims of Christ, sneak in the back, sneak out early, get here late. We don't care. We're just glad you're here. Keep coming, okay? You're safe here. Come check out the claims of Christ. I love you. Have a great week. I'll see you next week. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.